thanks uh, for everyone making time um, for our latest hangout. It's always good to see so many people here. Our, we've got kind of really one main topic um, for today, um, which is just have a discussion around um, event attendance and booking. Um, I've got a couple of slides just to help frame that discussion. Um, I, but I, I don't have anything uh, particularly to bring to the table for this. I'm kind of looking to get input from you all on uh, where we need to, uh, where, where we might need to make some uh, changes or improvements to the specification. So I'm hoping to go away with a bit of insight and some requirements from this. Um, so, uh, so that's our kind of main kind of agenda item. If there's anything that um, anyone wants to, to bring up, um, then uh, uh, please do so. Um, uh, I've, I can get, uh, Nick mentioned that um, uh, Kim is not able to attend today, so I can give a quick update on the activity list stuff as well. Um, for those people who want now, I'm just gonna share, share my slides. So yeah, so main agenda item, event attendance and booking, uh, NEOB, so, uh, me a shout if there's anything you else want to cover and then just a review of what we'll be doing at the next few meetings. Um, so I circulated a kind of outline agenda and it's kind of some dis uh, discussion points um, a week or so ago. Um, I've just come back from holiday um, so hopefully you've had time to, uh, uh, we've all had time to think about that over the last, uh, last uh, short while. Um, what I want to kind of focus on is to really just think about um, how what we're doing with the the current opportunity data data model, how that will ultimately align with what we want to do um, further down the line with booking. Um, so, where um, so to my mind, we've we've got we're looking at kind of there's two separate phases to getting people more active. There's helping them um, discover or find the events, activities, and the opportunities that are happening around them. Uh, and that's been our current focus. And then there's actually getting them to participate. Um, and a key part of participation is signing up, booking, uh, and getting involved. So there's a um, handoff there from the kind of discovery phase off to the, the booking and participation phase. So while we're not planning to get into the details of booking um, just yet, we do need to make sure that those two phases align um, so, so that it, whilst we're still um, considering and researching how best to handle booking, that um, the open data that is being um, published and shared and used um, is supporting um, getting people more active so that there is some kind of handoff to whatever existing contact points, booking systems or workflows that people currently have. Um, so what we don't want to do really is um, end up publishing data that results in kind of dead end. So people can discover events, but then not work, figure out how, uh, how to go on from there, how to participate. So I, I put together this uh, next slide, which um, summarizes, I, th I think for me, or tries to summarize um, how these two phases align with one another. So on, on the discovery phase is, is, you know, is all the detail that we have in the current uh, specification, um, some of which are just about describing you know, um, basic details of the events, so uh, textual descriptions, dates and times, locations, you know, what will be happening, um, but also some things that are relevant to this kind of signposting and handoff for booking. So contact points to contact um, venues and organizers, any notes for attendees, um, things that I could also put in this category are things like capacity, so how many people um, can go to an event, whether it's fee or whether there's a, a fee to, to be paid, uh, any of the other kind of participation requirements like membership or equipment. So for me, that kind of discovery information is largely unchanging. It's that it's the current focus of the open data publishing work, um, it's mostly about, it's kind of descriptive information about uh, the event. But there, there has to be, as I say, some kind of signposting and handoff to booking. Um, and the things that uh, in, currently in my mind are under the kind of booking heading are things like 
what's the current availability for an individual session? You know, is it fully booked yet or not? Um, what options do I have to pay? Um, um, if, you know, if I have to pay, then what, what are my payment options? Are there different um, uh, payment, um, different ways that I can pay? You know, can I get a, uh, a discount if I um, book multiple sessions? Um, uh, is it worth my while to become a member and then I can pay less or it'll be free? Um, more detail on kind of pricing plans um, and then everything relating to the kind of transactional aspects of booking. So kind of confirmation, cancellation, um, you know, any updates that need to be pushed out to attendees. So that kind of information is, is more transactional and I think more dynamic, you know, because, you know, at least the availability is going to change over time. So that's kind of what, how I wanted to try and frame things in terms of um, I'd be interested in, in kind of collecting requirements for both, but I think that my, I think where we should be focusing our attention initially is in this, is making sure that there's enough on the discovery side of things so that we can hand over to, to booking. Um, so that's my, you know, that, that's the way that I've been viewing um, the work so far uh, and why I thought it was important to have a discussion to make sure that we're doing this handoff um, correctly at the moment. Um, to make sure we have no dead ends. Um, so really, I just kind of want to open it up to everybody at that point so, and, and uh, see what you think of that framing. Does that kind of make sense to you, These two, how these two phases align? Um, and uh, do you think there are uh, some missing elements to the model or areas that we need to refine it to make sure that um, we're covering these kind of use cases? Uh, thanks, Lee. Um, just one thing I'm not sure if it is appropriate for, uh, for this, but uh, is always required uh, when making a booking is terms of use of the pitches. Uh, and that's something we've come across a lot with all of our different partners, is making sure those terms of use are absolutely clear to the user or accessible by the user. Um, and I'm not sure if that should be put in here. Terms of use of... Pictures, did you say? Uh, of, the, of the pictures or pictures. Uh, facilities. <clears throat> what kind of detail goes into those? Is it just like a, a reference to a, a document that somebody has to read? Yes, exactly. Okay. It'd be useful to see an example of one of those. If you, I mean, you don't have to show it now, but um, sure. that's yeah. the list just so I can get a sense of what, what kind of things covered there. Yeah, it's liability and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, ben, you um, posted an email earlier. That I'm not sure whether everyone had, um, has had a chance to see it yet or not. Um, uh, you went into some uh, detail about how Open Sessions is handling some of this. Um, do you want to just kind of step us through through your thoughts? Yeah, sure. So um, I can talk about some of the fields, um, some of which seem to be included, some are not. Um, so Open Sessions lets um, providers who they often don't have booking systems um, they're often sort of smaller providers and sports clubs and um, the, the kind of I'll go through some of the fields that that we're kind of asking for uh, that we find important to, to giving the end user enough information to be able to go to something mm -hmm. um, so session leader um, which I've not seen on the spec I'm not sure if it's on there, which is basically who's the coach or who's in charge of the session um, that someone can look out for when they when they get there, um, and also that that may come with an, uh, a profile image. Then there's the um, session contact, the person you would contact if you had questions about a session beforehand, um, and we ask for either an, a phone number or an email address and a name. Uh, and what we find, what we find with open sessions is that often um, the the actual organizer of the session um, may be an organization, but then the person you'd contact is is sometimes different. Um, so we we allow that to be different. We allow that to be a different um, set of information. Um, but you could actually just say it's the same. A bit like when you check out and you say my billing address and my postal address is the same 
the same sort of thing um, we could do that field. Um, then moving on, it's first session free. Um, the, the options to, um, what we saw was that quite a lot of clubs let someone come and try things out before they have to pay for anything. Um, so we let providers advertise that on their session listing by just checking a box and saying, we offer a free first session. Um, then, so we've got options to say, this is a free session or it has a simple price, or in some cases there's a whole, um, pricing is a bit more complicated, so they might want to offer different prices for adults and concessions. Um, so within our interface, we've got, um, you can either just enter a price or, or be a bit more sort of specific about different groups and different prices. Um, then we've got, which I see has already been covered, the payment methods, so card or cash. Um, that's if somebody's actually paying um, when they get there. So we just try and make it as clear as possible whether you have to, um, you know, how do you have to um, bring cash, bring a card, book in advance, email the coach to say you're coming. Um, we just try and make that clear. Okay. And finally, just two more fields is the meeting instructions and what to bring. Um, which aren't directly related to booking, but we find um, that they're really helpful um, in terms of encouraging people to come along. Um, meeting instructions op often capture things that an address alone doesn't capture. And then what to bring often captures things that um, a session description often doesn't, doesn't actually manage to capture. And these are designed as prompts to, to basically get um, providers to describe the sessions um, in a better way, in a more sort of um, thoughtful way. Yeah, so that's it. Okay. So in those last couple then, do you actually store those as separate fields in your system? So there's a description, what to bring, and meeting instructions. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do others on the call have that similar breakdown, at least for kind of discussions? So Terry, what um, do you have a similar setup? Yeah, we have, um, I think we have a what to bring uh, field, I forget what it's called, but we have, you know, sort of bring, bring a towel, etc. Um, but we don't have detailed meeting instructions, but I'm thinking that's a, that's a really good idea, uh, to be honest, because even if you've got, some, some of our guys have got big venues, so it's useful to say, you know, you need to go down the end of the long corridor, turn left, not three flights of stairs type thing, that's, that's very useful. Right, okay. Okay. Uh, from a Gladstone point of view, we have, um, uh, additional information um, which is kind of free text so typically it's the non-marking cells in the squash court type thing um, it, uh, maybe a bit of extra information maybe even saying this is with such and such instructor so it's all in one place for us right okay so you just have a single descriptive field yeah yeah okay right yeah so at the moment in the in the spec we have just a generic description field but we haven't yet added in any any refinement to that. Um, so it's, it's useful to know that, that at least some systems break that out. Okay. Lee, I think the other one is, is whether membership is required. Because once you start, if you are going to, depending on who, if you went to a private sector operator and they said they would open up some of their, their data and push their opportunity data out, well, that's fine, but quite a lot of the time, you'd have to be a member of that thing to actually take part. And when we did SPOGO, we did some work with Fitness First of, they were opening up part of their sessions, so they would have spare capacity and they would open that up. But normally, you look, so you're showing that in a slightly different way than you would do a normal, normal event through Fitness First, because you can go into Fitness First Club without being a Fitness First member. But we did some work where we basically could show that these sessions here actually you can go in it's like a day fee or whatever and you're going in and using it for that particular session right okay okay so that seems like a pretty basic kind of almost like a category description for the event right 
how does this align with um, the kind of pitch booking that you do, Jamie? Have you got sort of similar information available? Uh, yeah, we always say if a uh, membership is required, uh, um, uh, and it tends to be either free, pay and play, or membership. Okay. Okay. Um, and what about the uh, descriptive information? Um, and other than the terms of term of use, is there any other kind of um, descriptions or text that goes with the description? Yes. Uh, and I, I think the free text field is um, a good way forward. We, we have it in what's called the description of each facility. And if there's any access information, then it can go in there. Uh, it's a bit of a Pandora's box because you don't have to go too far into it. Um, uh, but you want the, each person, each venue or facility or operator to have the ability to um, give uh, access information. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's useful. Um, so I'm just going back to um, one or two of the points that Ben was making at the start. So the, the session leader, uh, I'd like to discuss that a little bit because um, we do have some support for that in the in the spec currently. Um, so, but I just kind of want to check. It may be worth just looking at it just to see whether um, it's good enough or whether there's some refinements. Um, I'm going to see if I can bring up the diagram, which might make it easier. Um, so here's the here's the um, the current schema diagram. Can you all see that? Okay. I mean, the text is readable on it. But I need to make it larger. Um, shout if it's not. Um, so it's good. It's good. yeah. Okay. So we've got the event in in the middle, um, and an event can have uh, named people and organizations associated with it. And, and there's currently two ways that they can be associated. They can be um, marked as the organizer. So we can have um, the organizer be an organization or it could be a, a, an individual person. Um, or they can be a contributor. So that's somebody involved in running the event, but not necessarily the, the organizer. Um, so I think the way that I've documented at the moment is that, that the I think what you were calling the session leader would be um, the organizer. So uh, if there was a particular coach, then they would be the event organizer and we have properties there to give, you know, identify the name, uh, description if they want to put a bio, image, um, and schema.org also has some um, existing properties to uh, add kind of contact information, et cetera. So we've got a kind of basic framework for that. So what I think my question is, does organizer and contributor cover everything? Or do we need to kind of be um, uh, adding some more subtypes to those relationships? You know, so do we need to break out the you know, differences between a, a coach and a trainer and a session leader? Or is that kind of broad level enough? I think, uh, I think there's probably um, something quite useful to done, which is maybe insert another, um, another one, which is actually called something like leader. Because it's useful for the um, end user to know that it's being organized by it could be Virgin Active, it could be, uh, I'm doing leisure sense, obviously, uh, it could be uh, GLL, it could be, um, uh, you know, sporting, whatever the thing is. But useful to know who the organization is, which is different to who's actually leading the session. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I steered away from initially is trying to, is not trying to kind of end up with lots of different roles because it can, in some cases, it can be just unclear about which categories people fall into. So I went with these, um, these two, but um, breaking out leader might, might be a useful thing. Um, obviously, the one thing we immediately we bump into here is personal information. Um, and the fact that once we start providing names, images, um, contact points, phone numbers, and email addresses, then we're, we're kind of veering into information that we need to be careful about encouraging people to publish. Um, so you know in the spec at the moment we've got wording in quite a few places that that raises a kind of warning around that um and that people need to be opt-in to having this information 
being shared about them. So my assumption is, is that if somebody's entering this into a form as, as part of the, the leader or organiser, then they're happy to do that. Um, but it might be, there might, might be a bit of an onus on platforms to make this clear that this information might be shared more widely now if it's been published as open data. There's an interesting uh, point from um, on table tennis on, on Jamie's behalf. The table tennis booking system, they actually have a tick box to say, if you're an organiser, do you want to share your phone number with uh, everyone who, who accesses uh, as open data? Um, obviously, taking into account what we're saying about personal data. Um, for table tennis sessions, you're probably aware they're informal, they're probably in a pub, they're in one of these venues where, or whatever, that, that they found a table tennis table, basically, and they're gathering around it. Um, and so the phone number for the guy that's actually turning up and bringing the bats and the ball is the, is that's your entry point, right? There isn't a reception desk. Um, and so in that, that case, that contact person, that session leader is actually more fundamental than just, Oh, it's Jeff running it today. It's actually, you know, he's the guy that it's fundamental to, I need to call them and tell them I'm not going to be there or he's going to tell me it's canceled or whatever. It's a lot more personal. So I guess it's to be aware that this session leader field doubles as a, or well, maybe they're different roles, I don't know, but there's a different scenario where that person's more important than he is in other roles. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that would, yeah, that's, that's, that's useful. Because I, I was gonna ask about contact, because what we don't have at the moment is a, a specific kind of contact point um, for the event. The, my assumption has been that um, we will either use contact points for the organizer or contributor, or a contact point for the location, because we have schema.org already covers that, and the model already covers that, but it, I wasn't sure whether we needed to have contact for the event that was separate to this kind of relationship. Do you see what I mean? Um, Sorry, I think we have to be very careful about, about handing out or publishing, I mean, phone numbers as open data <coughs> with the GDPR, because otherwise, if someone wants, We'll be advocating stuff that under the right to be forgotten, you know, organizations could follow us and it could create a massive headache for them to people to transfer, to go back through how are you, when you push that information out, it's, you know, I don't think we should really be advocating people putting their personal phone numbers out as open data. You know, you want a kind of, <coughs> you, 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 you know, it should be more email contact or something else because otherwise, or it's work numbers and stuff like that, because otherwise I think it, it's getting very, it's getting very dangerous and very hard to manage potentially. Yeah, sure. And then um, we can we can certainly improve the wording in the spec to, to um, encourage people to think about how that gets populated. But some of this is an issue for the for the platforms. You know, it's for, for things like open sessions to think about what kind of user prompts they give people when they're filling in the forms. I suppose it'd be interesting. Agree. I, agree, I agree with that, but knowing how bad our sector is and looking at the, the poor, the, you know, the bonkersness stuff of a lot of small clubs because they don't have this knowledge, the danger is that we're, we, you know, they, they'll just continue to follow bad practice or potentially follow what could be bad practice. So this, I think this is the point of where when we develop all this stuff, we need to have a lot of this good practice stuff going alongside this because we just don't want to be encouraging the continuation of bad practices around data management. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's a fair point. I totally um, agree, Nick. I'd, on my just to retract my previous, um, I, I think that is what they, that, that is what table tennis are planning to do. But you're absolutely right. GDPR um, right to be forgotten. That that does that does pose a, a, a question around if you make the data open, then you you've lost the ability to pull it back again. Um, but I, I think we probably need some uh, because it, because obviously the user experience is is a is a challenge here because obviously if you can't provide a phone number or an email address to actually turn up at the session. Um, it will be difficult to actually attend the thing, which then undermines the kind of point of what we're doing. So, I, I fully agree that we can't we can't be telling people to publish stuff openly if if we can't then if they're then going to be in breach of legal regulation, right? We don't want to be putting them in that position. Um, I don't know whether that means that we have to think about the booking protocol a little bit more um, in the round. It's not just about transactional booking. It might be about the release of a phone number that you only get through the you know the, the the booking api which is shared data not open data for example um and maybe there's a there's a broader conversation about what that booking journey looks like for you know that, that then allows us to keep that control over that personal data because you're right it's a it's a quick fudge to say let's just publish the phone number openly but how do you pull that back when the regulations change 
especially when GDPR comes into play for all existing legacy data. So everyone's going to come a cropper of anything they've already published. You know, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, Nick. Just to say with open sessions, when we ask for an email address that users, um, for potential attendees can use, we never publish the email address publicly. So it's just done via a contact form. Um, and the intention with phone numbers is to mask that unless a user sort of goes looking for contact details. So it's, we haven't done that yet, but I've seen it um, on Gumtree. And that's where the idea originates from, where there's no phone number until you click on um, phone number and then it's revealed. So just a couple of ideas that might um, offer um, some solutions in that area. Yeah, I think the real challenge is if, if our guidance says, as long as you get explicit permission from someone, you can publish the phone number openly. That is technically correct. But as Nick says, that might be exposing them to additional risk they're not aware of in more than just the simple case in order to provide the facility you're saying Ben, in terms of that you know click to reveal because you'd still need that data published to reveal unless the booking api facilitated that reveal which we could do so that the you know booking api you kind of ping it and it says right here's the phone number now within that sharing um the, the you then control yeah i guess i guess what's tricky is, is just where so we can include that kind of facility in the booking api but what about systems where there isn't a booking? There's not a booking system going to expose an API. You know, if it is just contact Joe Blogs because he's going to ring the bats, we need to we need to have something to fill that gap. Whether it's guidance, uh, well, guidance feels like it's a minimum, but um, it's like the standard ought to have something to provide a framework. Um, but I think trying to improve what the sector's doing is is something that we probably need to escalate up to open active as the project rather than for this standards group because I think the people that that might need to read that kind of guidance around personal data um, you know UX permissioning things is it's kind of outside the the mod you know the modeling opportunity data specification is much more broad than that um, so there's a kind of educational piece there I think um, and we did talk about it when we when we started developing the program with the ABR about where this bit would fit around the, the GDPR and personal data and, and, the, and the program. And I think we said we were going to go away and have another think about it. And it might be it, it, it may be something that we look at as a kind of module to support some of the work. But I think you know where we can, we should definitely pointing out to users the implications of the GDPR and what they need to do and be aware of all these issues around publication of any personal data and just make sure it's cross reference. I know that that's as far as we can go in terms of what we do in the standards group, but then yes, then there needs to be a separate bit of kind of the, the better education for the sector through club matters and other, other means. Yeah, okay. So the idea, we haven't published them yet, but we've got some draft but, um, uh, guidance around handling of uh, personal data from a kind of product point of view. So things to be thinking about during development uh, and release and kind of operations. Um, so that I think is relevant to this, um, but it could also be tailored to the domain um, so that it's using, you know, so it's a bit more specific advice um, for the kind of things we've been discussing here. Right, so I, I've made a note of that, something that we need to discuss more widely. Um, so the, I'm just gonna go back to Ben's list. Uh, so we talked about leaders, contact points. Oh yeah, so, so pricing. Um, so let, let me, I just wanted to show you the kinds of stuff that um, schema.org currently provides, um, just as a kind of, because I, I, I would be using this, I think, as our starting point. So it'd be useful just to kind of test, um, test how well you think this, this matches the kinds of stuff that you're doing. Uh, I'm just gonna try and share my browser. Um, hopefully you can see uh, the event page on schema.org. Um, again, shout if you can't. Um, so there's a big list of properties here. Um, we're using a number of them already, um, but the one I think is relevant here to this discussion um, is what they call offers. Um, so an event can have multiple offers associated with it. So um, 
uh, and I think they even give a kind of event tickets as an, uh, as an example. So they have a way of describing an offer, um, which includes the ability to be able to say uh, payment methods, whether the offer is available for a limited, limited period. Um, it's got, there's a whole load of things in here because it's covering kind of product sales as well, but um, price, currency, um, also I think some, some go around, yeah, elig um, eligibility, customer type. So I think it will happily cover the kind of things where we want to put um, price, you know, price for members, non-members, adults, concessions, the kind of basic things that, um, that Ben was talking about. So we have, we have some vocabulary we can build on there. Um, has anyone got other requirements that they've seen around pricing that it might be useful just to kind of test against this? I was going to say in the, um, in the, systems that we've, we've looked at so far there's something about um the the constraint there's the constraints around that eligibility there's quite a bit well I've, i mean this is probably more tom than me actually tom because a lot of that's coming from the gladstone system and i know you've got a lot in there around uh constraining the pricing tiers and there's a whole thing in that isn't there yeah i think the the two things that are most complicated and that concern me are availability and price um, so from a pricing point of view, yes, typically people might do a non-member and then a member price for a badminton session that might be off peak and peak as well. Um, but you then might extend it and say, you've got a gold, silver, bronze tiers memberships and they pay different prices. Um, people may get it for free because they've bought a, um, 12 for 10 pass type thing. Um, so they might be getting free because of other things they've got associated with them. So I think at the moment for Nick, I'm struggling to even specify what the non-member prices are for people without making assumptions um, from an operator point of view. Um, from a actual what the price is going to be, it, it does involve quite a lot of different options really. Um, and it's not very, it's not very flat. It's quite um, sort of three dimensional. Yeah. So, so in principle, then you might actually need to know something about the individual. Who might almost. Yeah, yeah. Almost certainly. So, something like date of birth is a prime example as to whether you're going to be charging a junior rate for an adult rate. Um, it may be that juniors aren't allowed into that event anyway. Um, it might be a an adult spinning session type thing. It might be in the gym, and they need to be over fourteen. Um, so that's around eligibility as well as price so yeah interesting thing to, to add in here i, I did uh, i used to work in um, in the travel sector funny uh, uh, and um, um one of the standards that they use uh, in galileo actually has this thing called indicative price um and they use that quite a bit in terms of um the the packages that you would you you know about package holder has an indicative price uh, the idea being that when you purchase the package holder depending on the add-ins add-ons that you whatever you add to all of that and then when you put the actual people in the kids and the adults or whatever that that might be a slightly different price and so i wonder if if an indicative price might because that's what they use to kind of get around a lot of the complexity of the final price because you never actually use the indicative price in a transaction that's only displayed to the user just to know if you sort by price in a list or if you want a rough idea of if you can even, if it's even, even worth going on the booking journey. Um, that's just an idea. Yeah, I, it's, it's a good suggestion actually. I think, I was, um, sorry Lee. Um, no, go, go ahead. Uh, I, I think something around that is, is good and certainly what we publish is the uh, kind of full price adult without any memberships. Um, and we do split that up by time, um, but we don't uh, make any assumptions as to membership or anything like that. And perhaps the difference between uh, this industry and the travel industry is um, they do have a lot of add-ons, whereas we don't so much. Uh, and therefore, the kind of highest price is perhaps the um, best one to, to publish when it comes to be able to filter venues by price or source it by price. Uh, and then if people have memberships and they will tend to know what their discount roughly will be 
uh, from that. Um, and it's always good to show people discounted price at the end of the journey, um, you know, it makes them feel that they're getting a deal. Um, so certainly from NLP's point of view, we just show the kind of full price for an adult, depending on the time of booking, uh, and don't make any assumptions as to the membership. So uh, I think we've had lots of conversations in the past about whether to show the maximum price it could be or show the minimum price and say from X and X. Um, I think more recently we've actually gone to a price range. So we've said prices from £10 to £15 and then probably putting a flag alongside it to say it could be inclusive as part of your membership. Um, which equally, once we ha if we have one price, we only show the one price. So if there's no range, if it, they're all the same price, we just say it's ten pounds. So that's, that's a different way of displaying things as well. That makes a lot of sense. So I mean, you're absolutely right. This is totally different to travel in that respect because the ranges can be a, 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 a lot, a lot smaller. Uh, yeah, and certainly that. I was just thinking because although the max might work for some cases, depending on the activity. Uh, it could be more likely you're paying a different uh, concession. I mean, if you're, for example, if you're if you're looking at a, uh, a 60 plus activity, maybe you have people who aren't don't qualify for the senior tier, but most people going to that session will be seniors. I don't know. Okay. Okay, that's giving that's giving me some things to think about. Um, I mean, it, it may be that, I mean, using some of the markup, I was just briefly showing there that we can uh, document some kind of usage patterns there that people can, can decide upon, um, you know, whether they want to show ranges or maximum prices, um, or, or and maybe even annotate them to say, you know, concessions available kind of thing to indicate that that might not be the final price. What we're effectively doing is, is based on a complicated set of calculations, we're trying to, we're calculating a maximum minimum and a, and a indicative or something um, from that and then I guess it's up to the consumer of data to display as Jamie says he might display the maximum someone else might display the indicative someone else might display the price range of maximum to minimum and not worry about the indicative depending on the use case um, I wonder whether that's um, rather than standardizing because I think it's absolutely fair that in some cases you might just want to display max and that's just the way that you decide to you know, inform your users. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could you could say that from a purely kind of discovery oriented kind of view of the world, just knowing that it's free or not free, um, you know, at a course level is 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 enough. Um, because the the thing that we have to have to allow for is the fact that when um, when somebody um, is you know, start, it's going to make the step from having discovered an event to booking it. The system that they're looking at might know who they are. It might be able to kind of separately look at more of the kind of shared information around booking anyway. So it's not necessarily that, you know, that the, 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 at that point um, that there's no context available. So it's just kind of working out where we want to have a kind of dividing line really. The other consideration is probably most of the complexity when it comes to pricing is for essentially existing customers. It's the people that live in the borough and they have a concession card or people that already have a membership. Um, and certainly promoting and getting more activity, you almost looking at potentially a slightly different user um, of being that first customer um, or that casual customer, in which case the pricing is probably a lot simpler. Um, the only problem that has is we need to understand all the pricing in order to give the simpler pricing. But it may be that you, there's some certainly shortcuts to start off with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just one, one final one, Lee, on the, uh, in terms of the way the system kind of works, having the data with a price in it published before we engage with the booking step. Um, and then the way that the, the, the James systems wide and, and, and other systems as well, um, that data being published populates all the kind of search, all the kind of criteria and all that stuff to get you to the point of booking. It's only when you actually start the booking journey, you're then picking one session to, in, to go through with a session ID 
and taking that through the journey of, okay, now I'm going to, you know, get the details and clarify the price and all the rest of it. Um, everything prior to that selection of an individual activity to pursue in the journey is all around um, slicing and dicing data, which is more in the kind of open end rather than the shared end of the uh, spectrum. So just be aware, aware, I suppose, if we don't have a price in the open data, it, it could be limiting to quite a lot of use cases, especially when you've got boutique yeah. fitness, which is like, you know, boutique fitness where you've got four or five times the price for exactly the same session because it's, you know, in a different facility. And that's not always obvious unless you actually drill in. Obviously, we don't want people having to click through each one to find that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we talked about uh, it's pricing, talked about contact points, uh, descriptions. So um, Tom mentioned um, kind of events uh, eligibility. Um, so we have some support for that in the in the specification already. Um, so this section uh, five five three, which is what we've called event suitability. So at the moment we can specify that an event is suitable for an age range height and weight range um, and, re and uh, gender restriction, so male, female, or mixed audience. Um, are there other type, are there other types of eligibility that we should be thinking about? Or do you think that covers everything? So I guess that's directed at Tom initially. Yeah, I'm scratching my head. Um, there's always the odd case that will go ex uh, exceptional to those. Um, Typically, the main one is member or not member, um, that things are only available to member. Um, I think we came to this before. But other than that, the ones you've gone there, sorry, I was thinking, the other than that, the ones you've covered off that cover it, the only, the only consideration is the other end. And again, it's thinking about the use cases where people already have a relationship with that operator, is if they had unpaid sales, debts against their account, if they've been particularly flagged as a bad customer or something like that, then they may not be able to, to book. Um, but you need all of the information about them before you can then say they're not able to, they're not allowed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's very much in the kind of booking, the booking side of things on the, in the shared data space. Yeah. Um, Okay, well that's that's good that we've got the kind of core stuff there. Um, so it validates some of the decisions we've made so far. Um, so is there anything else? Um, are there any? You know, we've we've kind of looked at just uh, descriptions, contact points, kind of pricing, eligibility. Um, so were there other things that we think that are important to that kind of handoff from discovery to? booking. Um, I think I'd mentioned capacity, so kind of event attendance size. Um, there is There are properties for that um, in Schema.org that we could just add to our spec. And there's also, um, uh, there's, there's, the, there's availability, so what's remaining from capacity, but there's also the notion, or again, Tom could go into more detail on this, that you can't necessarily book something immediately. Um, if it's three days away, you might have a two day window from the day of the thing to book it. I mean, you're only allowed to book it within two days of the thing or two weeks or two, two months, depending on it, what, it, what it is. Um, so that can be useful to, as to whether you allow people to even enter the booking journey because you just can't, you can't start it. Is that right? Yeah, pretty spot on. So. Um, yeah, things become available at different times, particularly for different different people. Um, so when you're talking to a sort of anonymous people, you kind of have to assume it's available for them. And then once you start to go down the route of the bookings journey, it may then not be available for a number of days yet. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. Well, Sorry, just just uh, apologies. Just on that, um, have we got a field? I'm not. I'm not seeing it, but I could be missing it. Have we got a field for this activity has been or this event has been cancelled? Because quite a lot of the time, people want to see it um, with the cancelled flag next to it, so they know that you know. Usually, I go on a Thursday, or whatever. But 
this particular one is, is not happening for any reason. Uh, I don't think we have, no. Um, I, I, you know, we, haven't, we haven't documented it in the opportunity data spec, but um, schema.org has a event status property, which is supposed to be used to indicate whether something has been cancelled or rescheduled. Um, so we can be, uh, we should probably bring that through in the, as an example, um, at least in the primer, if not the main spec. That's a good catch. Thank you. I think for us, the um, if something's been cancelled, um, like a regular session class or something like that, it's more likely it's going to come up at the availability stage more than the discoverable stage. So it's going to be at the start of the bookings journey. Okay. Uh, what's your shallow? Okay. Also, just wanted to say there's one thing I forgot to include in my list, which is um, a categorization of coached or uncoached. Some sessions, um, they have a definite leader who's sort of um, telling people what to do. Others, um, they don't have that. And I wanted uh, just to bring that up. There is a distinction between coached and uncoached or led or unled sessions that you get. Okay, so go, going back to what, um, the uh, breakdown I was just discussing about um, organizer, contributor, and if we added leader as another option, then I think that would cover that. So that if it was a if it was a led session, there would be a, an indicated leader, and then not if otherwise. It still means you can indicate that there are people there as contributors or organizers, but not necessarily leading the event. Does that assume, sorry, go on then. Yeah, I was just going to say, often that's the case, but it's not always. What, what we've seen in open sessions is that um, sometimes the, the organizer session isn't actually a qualified coach and they're, they're sort of facilitating the session, but not um, leading it in the same way as a coach would. Um, perhaps a bit of an edge case, but it does happen. And also a lot, sometimes the, the leader isn't known or doesn't want to be shared or changes too frequently to write, write down. That's a, that's a common one where the leader might be one of four people and you find out when you turn up, um, but it is, an, it is coached. So they wouldn't put the name because they don't know who it is, but, or they might put four people and ram it into the field with slashes in between. We've seen that as well. Um, uh, but the point being that they're all coaches, so it doesn't matter who's, which coach is on on Tuesday. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's more of a category thing. Great, cool. Um, right, so we've, we've got a few minutes left. Um, was there anything else that anyone wanted to bring up today? Uh, any feedback on the, the spec? Uh, any update on anything that you're working on that you want to share with the group? I got one. Um, I've actually sent I've sent the link to uh, to Nick for um, we've we've got a feed together and it would be really useful to have someone who's not me uh, look at it and just see whether it's making sense or not. Um, Are we okay to share that with the group, Terry? I didn't ask before. I've yeah, I guess so. Written email. Um, it, it's on our staging server, so it might disappear. It's not the live server yet, but, um, but yeah, feel free to share. It's not a problem. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, Looks well, really good, by the way. Oh, thank you. It'd be good to share that with the um, with the with the list. I think for people to look at. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and and so, something. Um, could you just go back to that slide, Lee, uh, that you had a second ago? Which, which one? Uh, the you... one with the list of booking on the right and availability on the left. Yeah. Um, the question I was going to ask about this was that um, a, a lot of the time in general conversation. Um, we've been talking about booking in terms of the transaction. Um, and so, you know, that the, the, the point, I think what, like what Tom was saying, the point where you moved from, you move from using the shared data to using the open data and it becomes a, it becomes a two way conversation where you pass in user details and it gives you back stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff that's in the booking stage here um, is more around, this is a, this is open data. 
that would facilitate the bridge to booking. Um, but I just kind of being, it, it's more a scoping question really, because I guess my understanding previously was that what's on this slide is all in the scope of our current thinking now, because it's stuff that we're exposing from the systems as open data. Um, the booking stuff, which is we're doing in whenever the booking stuff comes around uh, later on, is going to be more around the transaction, open API, but not open data type stuff. Um, but I didn't see the list here as being in the booking camp. Uh, this this stuff appears to be more in the kind of discovery. Is that, I was just checking, was that the intention or was that um, around the word booking here in the slide, basically, that we don't mean booking transaction, we mean booking uh, open data. Um, yeah, okay, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that I think the majority of the stuff I've got on the right could be part of the open data. So it's more just trying to scope where we're having our discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make a distinction between, you know, raising awareness and doing the discovery around events and then the next stage, which I've just labeled booking here. But um, for me, the kind of the scope of the booking work is the the shared data, the kind of the booking APIs you've described it, but some of this stuff, which is actually about business models for you know how people are pricing and selling events. Um, I, I didn't think that what like, I didn't think that was actually in scope for the the opportunity data stuff that we're doing now. Um, but you know that's open for, for open for discussion really. Yeah, I guess it's well. It's just mainly because the kind of data that we're we're talking about making open a lot of the time has the stuff on the right in it, um, to a greater or lesser extent, um, for for a lot of the initial use cases. Because effectively, if we're publishing activities without prices, even indicative prices, it is arguably less useful for consumers to just you know have the name without anything at all to indicate that. Um, uh, and the same with availability, because if the session isn't that, is full. Um, then again, it's not it's not as useful as the saying that there's a session, but it's it's got some spaces. So um, I guess that's where that, that would be my, my question. So I, I totally understand why we'd save the booking transaction piece till later because that's a whole separate flow APIs set of set of things to think about. But I wonder whether this stuff is is more part of this conversation um, as a kind of logical extension of the, the, the work we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what. I haven't got an immediate answer to that. Um, it partly because um, I think it would be useful to have a look to see how well the existing schema.org offer stuff works for the kinds of use cases people have for this stuff. So um, we, um, it'd be good uh, for the for you all to take a look at that to see whether it kind of covers the kinds of use cases. Because if it does, then you know it, there's not a great deal of work. Um, in extending it, if there's a if we have to do a um, a lot of new modelling work because it's not quite right, then I think we just need to make a call about whether that this that's the right place to focus attention on, um, because it feels to me like some of the some of the stuff around the kind of the, the open parts of the things on the right um, uh, is useful to support the kind of filtering. Um, functionality that you were discussing, you know, finding the kind of cheapest local event or finding free events locally. So um, I would put that in a kind of, there's lots of ways that we might want to filter and drive discovery of events. Um, so it'd be useful to know whether pricing is actually the most important way of doing filtering and discovery or whether there's other areas of the spec that might need more attention first. You know, so it's just got almost a prioritization thing. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Lee, I mean, if I looked at it on the right, Lee, I would say things like payment options, payment methods and pricing could easily be useful as additional information as part of that discovery. But I think when you talk about current availability, that almost suggests you're looking at serving up APIs and once you get this current availability capacity, you open up all the Pandora's box about facility sizes, what things you can do at different times of the day. Um, I think, and then the cancellation and confirmation, that again, sounds like more of a live type transaction around booking. So, maybe that we have a look at it at those with some of that criteria or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that some of those um, availability and, and cancellation, I suppose they are, they are more real time, but I suppose as is, 
all of this data ideally would be real time so that if people change the actual detail of when the event is or whatever that it is 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 updated so i suppose there's a um certainly if in, in the simple case for availability we're just talking about whether the class is still available or not to book as in is it yes available not available no or even the third case if there's not many spaces left maybe as a kind of three three step tiers not necessarily there's five spaces or 20 spaces just that you know is the thing there because effectively as this came up in a, in a conversation the other day that um you know there's a center there's a site which has classes all of those classes are full because the members book them within five minutes of them going live and so to display those classes on a website where all of them are full and maybe there's one space in one class um, isn't the best experience because it doesn't. And, and then the question was, well, should we display them? Should we open that data at all? Because it's going to mislead users. Um, they were saying, well, if you, if you open the data, but include the availability in the data, then it's really good information. So they know there are classes happening, even though they can't book them. So it's not going to set their expectations that there are, you know, all these, all these sessions they can go and attend because actually all the members have already booked them. Um, and that's, this is quite a common case with a lot of, a lot of lo local um, uh, authority sites where they've got, um, a small amount of capacity for high demand sessions, uh, especially in this kind of exercise movement dance area. Yeah, okay. But I would, I would almost say there's a bit of a difference here between the objectives of the program, which is one of it is opening up opportunity data and starting off with that. And then the bit about trying to develop the standards around it. But I would almost say, you know, trying to develop the standards around all that current availability and all the other stuff is where you would that's where you would get into a lot more, it would become a lot more complicated. Yeah, so, I th so for me, the, I mean, I agree with what, what, you, what you're both saying, actually, but it, so the, the, it feels like the decision point is, um, at what point have you gone beyond discovery? Right? So it seems to me that it's reasonable for people to know um, whether there is, um, you know, from a from a discovery point of view, whether they will have to pay, or, or, or even uh, when an event has some availability, even if we don't know how many places are available, uh, you know, I, I could imagine using a discovery interface to support that. But going beyond it into how will I pay, or what are the detailed pricing options that are available for me, or to different categories of user, that feels more like it's gone beyond discovery. You know, nobody's going to. Uh, try and find events where they can pay by Visa or PayPal, for example. That doesn't seem like a, an obvious use case. So that's where I would, I would prefer to part that kind of stuff and come back to it, um, unless there was existing things that we can just reuse. Lee, the, the thing for me that falls in between is we, we're typically talking about sessions here that are scheduled and have dates and times and stuff. Once you go to sort of an activity that doesn't, so badminton can happen every 15 minutes it takes half an hour um assuming there's not something else booked in the badminton courts um that that level of availability is actually quite complicated because we need to check all of the space there is a is it booked out for cleaning all that sort of stuff before giving the availability whereas the, the example nick gave a minute ago of a class well the class is booked in it's there it's it's happening uh, and then just working out the capacity is easy so um there's sort of different things on the table here that um, like classes are inherently a lot easier than something like activities like badminton or squash or things like that. Yeah. So you might end up saying this site does badminton and it's maybe three pounds, but it's not probably not until you start on that booking journey on that sort of proper availability to see is there badminton at 8 p.m. on a Tuesday evening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you very much cross the threshold then from yeah. from yeah. yeah. Okay. Although just to add another, uh, <laughs> so yeah, actually totally agree, Tom. That, that, and especially classes being as they are and being busy and crazy, that's good to separate those two out. Uh, if we if we kind of group that as classes and facilities as two separate kind of categories, sounds like I think I agree. Classes is so simple for availability to say yes, it's available. No, it's not. Maybe there's some spaces left that could be done quite simply. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting about facility availability is that you don't, again, for discovery purposes, we don't necessarily care about whether court one or court two or court three is available. Um, it could be sufficient just to know that the product of five aside is available or is not available at a certain time in a certain place. Um, so there are simplifications to make on that um, that maybe get, I, I understand this is a little bit of how MLP um, 
that does the availability stuff um, for, for facilities. But I guess what I'm just saying is that it, you think it's, it's definitely there's a I feel like there's there's the simplicity of, of classes, which is just really simple. Then there's the facilities, but only product availability, which is just can I book a fiber side pitch at this place without all the detail behind it. And then there's the kind of stuff that's booking level, which is, you know, when you come to say, I want to book the fiber side pitch, which is the one that's available and, you know, and all the, all the kind of other stuff that's in there. Um, and maybe, you know, is there a fiber side pitch available between five and 6 PM is what's available in the kind of middle case. But then in the detail, you might be able to shift that by 15 minutes or I don't know, whatever it is. So it's almost suggesting that we, there's a level of complexity we definitely don't want to go into, which is all about resource stuff, but there might be something a little bit above that that still provides the value. And I, I, I kind of, Jamie, I'm kind of talking about your use case really here more than anything, but um, assuming it's useful to be able to tell people that there is that availability. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right there. Um, there are different levels of kind of data that you can give the user. Um, and uh, certainly it is quite a complex uh, question, but um, it's always nice to go for the, uh, good to go for the kind of simple case first uh, and then try to um, uh, uh, where, where necessary layer on top of that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Well, I'd like to take carry this discussion on on the mailing list. So is there a way that we can just start uh, in between now and the next uh, call just keep this going. Maybe Jamie, you could um, post some examples of the kinds of um, ways that you're describing these kind of availability and um, pricing, just so we've got some data to look at. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. And if anybody else has got other other examples to kind of throw into the mix, it would be useful to see if we can just come uh, to some understanding of what some broad kind of common requirements are. Um, because it, it just feels like going it's starting to go into distinction now, you know, classes versus facilities and having starting to get in custom markup that feels a little bit beyond where we need to be at the minute. Um, I'd like to get some kind of va more validation of the kind of broader data model before kind of adding more, more detail at this stage. Um, um, so uh, just before we, before we kind of wrap up, I mean, is there, any, is there anything else that anyone wants to, to bring up on the call today. Um, uh, I can just give you a very brief update on um, the activity list stuff we were talking about last time. Um, I, um, so after our last call and we kind of decided to start, start just putting together a kind of merged list based on those that have been shared so far, um, I did some initial work just to pull together a, um, a common spreadsheet that had everything in um, from um, Sport England, um, Sport Suite, and EMD. Um, and Kim, uh, one of her colleagues, has been working on merging that in. So they, um, they just shared that uh, list with me uh, uh, yesterday. Um, so I haven't had a chance to have a look at it. Um, but she's kind of get, they're getting to a point of having a candidate list that we could start to look at as a group. Um, so what I was uh, thinking that we could do is. Um, We'll have a, a look at that on the next call. Um, so we're due to have a, a bit more of a discussion around um, disability support, um, because that's an area that uh, we know we need to make some improvements on. So I was going to cover that, uh, and then um, perhaps if Kim is at the next one, or Jade, then we can go into the activity list proposal as it is. Does that sound okay to everyone? But, um, it's great. Can we, so, can we, Lee? Can we, if possible, can we get them to circulate the list prior to the meeting so we can have a chance to have a look at it beforehand? Yes, we'll do. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's still very much a work in progress. Um, but I, I, I'm really pleased that they've kind of um, taken uh, taken ownership of that and just kind of starting to put together something for the rest of the group. Um, but yeah, definitely circulate it for review. Um, is that push out our um, disabilities uh, theme to a, a week after that a session after that then um no i think i i i think um so jade briefly went through some of the disability stuff um that they had uh, for emd last time um so uh, i think i don't i don't think we need the whole session for it is what i'm saying um so i think we can just do 
Um, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll circulate a proposal for the for some modifications to the spec, specifically around disability support that we can just um, hopefully just review and sign off in the call, and then we can have the rest of the um, discussion on the activity list. Okay. Um, Right, uh, so I think that is it today, unless anyone wants to um, raise anything else. Um, just, oh, just, a, just a, sorry. Go on, go ahead. Just a quick teeny tiny one, which is um, we were populating the end point for serving up the, um, which uh, events have been updated or, um, or deleted. And I was just, um, I was a little bit confused, wondering whether we should have uh, another status of created because at the moment I've just got, we've got, I've also got something like 8 million events to populate and all of them are updated even though, you know, the brand, brand new ones coming on will be a new record as opposed to a record that exists. So does the paging spec have a kind of created date in it already? It has a... No, it's, got, it, yeah. it's got a status and the status is either updated or deleted. So I was just wondering whether it should have a created or uh, new, something like that. Yeah, and the and the updated uh, it comes with a date. Um, what would be the use case for created? Is that in, in terms of data consumer? What would what would be? Well, but what's what's happening at the moment is when I'm populating the list, um, they're all marked updated, and I'm putting all of the data in. Whereas what uh, what seems to be like updated should be for if a record already exists, you change a couple of fields, in which case you just serve that data. Because so at the moment, I'm serving all the data for all the records. Oh, you mean like a diff? from the previous state. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, so yes, the paging spec doesn't, uh, doesn't, I don't think covers that at the moment. It's just doesn't, there's no facility for, for diffs. Um, but that's a really good question. It's effectively patch, right? In, in um, HTTP uh, yeah. terminology. Uh, yeah, exactly. post, and, post and patch. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. We haven't, there's no patch. It's just post um, because of the simplicity. Um, but uh, that would probably reduce the volume of up, of updates. Is what you're thinking for? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Something good thing to think about there. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, okay, I think that's one to come back come back to as well. Mm. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap us up there because we've run we've run over time. Um, so thanks uh, everybody for coming along. Another really good discussion. Uh, thanks again for those of you who are uh, watching from home for the recording. Um, I've got a few actions to follow up some of the discussions on the list. Um, so I'll circulate a summary in the next day or so. Okay. Thanks Lee. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Cheers. Thanks,